Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. So thanks everybody for coming to uh, today's colloquium. As I always stress every time, for me, this is one of the most important events every week for NCSA uh, to uh, take some time out from your daily grind to come and listen to a, a talk about what's going on in science or engineering or in computing, uh, things that are really relevant for what we do, but uh, we all don't often have enough time to really stop and listen and think about it. So we've arranged a very outstanding group of speakers um, this year and started also last year to uh, each week take an hour, describe what they're doing in science uh, and how it's impacting computing or vice versa, how computing is impacting their science and it goes both ways. So it's very important, I think, for all of us. So I just always ask you, um, if you're at NCSA, uh, please don't schedule regular meetings during this time and come and, and build a culture of, of uh, coming. We also have time after the um, talk to, uh, to chat and get to know each other a little bit, so there'll be a reception afterwards. And for those of you who are coming from the outside, uh, thanks for coming over. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good event for us to kind of get to know the campus as well. So um, today is really important for us, I think, because we have a great speaker and a, a great scientist, Tandy Warnow, who's joined uh, the university just about a year ago. Is it a year ago? I think not around, even, not, not even a year ago. Six months ago. Six months ago. Uh, very new here. And uh, Tandy is an expert in an area that I think is really the, the defining science of the 21st century, which is really the cross-section between biology and biological systems and computing. And I mean, I'm a physicist, and I think you know you could almost fairly say last century was the, the century of physics. Uh, this century is very different. And so this is a great opportunity to really look at what the trends are that are going to not only transform this domain, uh, but also I think NCSA and the campus itself are going to be very strongly driven by this. There's a lot of talk about a new medical school. I think that's likely to happen. Still hasn't been uh, uh, really decided on by the, uh, the Board of uh, Trustees of the University of Illinois, but that'll be considered next month. There's a new department, fairly new department of bioengineering at the university, and Tandy's a member of that. And so it's a great, uh, great time to hear about this. So let me just do a brief introduction of Tandy herself. Tandy Warnow is the founder professor in bioengineering and in computer science here, but she has many affiliations across campus, and in fact, we're talking a lot with Tandy about what we might do in, in, uh, in um, bio biology and in computational genomics and so on. So she is also um, at the Institute for Genomic Biology in the biocomplexity theme. And as you know, we have a potentially uh, developing joint themes between NCSA and the IGB and other institutes around campus, so this is of great interest to us. She's an affiliate in the departments of mathematics, statistics, um, animal biology, and entomology. So it gives you an idea. Uh, I think this nicely illustrates convergence, the, the theme I've been talking about, where you have many disciplines converging into new disciplines, and this is converging through a single person here. In fact, it's very almost a singularity of convergence. Uh, Tandy has her PhD in mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley, and also a bachelor's degree, and she's a national leader in combining mathematics, computer science, probability, and statistics to develop algorithms for complex problems in phylogenomics. Uh, multiple sequence alignments and metagenomics. She also works in historical linguistics uh, as well, applying mathematical techniques to estimate how language families have evolved. So let me um, welcome Tandy and I uh, look forward to your presentation, Tandy. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so this, the pictures here are about birds, and I'm going to be telling you about a phylogenetic analysis that we did of a group of birds. This is published in a, articles in Science in, in December of 2014. Okay, so a phylogeny is just an evolutionary tree, and you've seen lots of them, so this is just a simple example how some different species evolved from a common ancestor. And so the question is, how does one estimate this? This turns out to be a really interesting question that combines statistics, computer science, and of course biology. So the tree of life, which is how do you get at evolution out of all of life, not just you know, four different hominids, is an enormously interesting area with many grand computational challenges. Almost everything is NP-hard, which means you can't solve anything exactly on big data sets. And there are really big data sets. So data sets including you know, multiple millions of species, um, tens to hundreds of thousands of genes, and lots of what we call big data complexity, which means you have lots of noise, 
you have errors, you have model misspecification, you have streaming data, all sorts of stuff. And there's many different computational problems you might want to address, including just how do you get a single tree from a single gene versus how do you get a species phylogeny? How do you deal with horizontal gene transfer? How do you deal with genome rearrangements? All sorts of things. So today I'm just going to talk about this one problem, which is how does one get a species tree from multiple genes, which is to say multiple parts of the genome, which may or may not be genes. So don't worry about that. Just think of different parts of the genome. How do you get a species tree from multiple parts of the genome when the trees on those different parts can be different? So that might even seem possible to get a tree on the species level when the different parts of the genomes have different histories. And that's itself an interesting thing that I'm going to explain. Okay, so that's today's talk is just how do you do this one thing. So this is called phylogenomics, which is the intersection basically of genomic data with phylogeny estimation. So you have multiple genes from across the genomes and you want to get out that evolutionary history, phylogenomics. I'm going to tell you about work we did in two different projects. The first one is the Avian Phylogenomics Project, which published eight papers in science in December 2014. So all of these uh, papers were focused on how do, how do we understand how birds evolved and how do we use that understanding to answer different biological questions. So I'm on two of the papers there. One of the papers actually presented the phylogeny, and the other one presented the technique we used to get at this species tree taking gene tree discordance into account. So I'll be telling you largely about how we did that. But you'll notice that I list two challenges here. One of them is this maximum likelihood estimation on a million site genome scale alignment. So maximum likelihood is an NP-hard optimization problem. We're trying to analyze roughly 50 species, but with very, very, very large amounts of data for each species. So we end up having these very long sequences, which are multiple millions of sites in length, so multiple millions of nucleotides long, and we're trying to run a maximum likelihood heuristic. That heuristic took more than 200 CPU years and did not use NCSA, but it did use other supercomputing centers around the world. So there's some really interesting just research for how do you do high performance computing on these kinds of statistical estimations that we could actually talk about. But that's one problem. The other problem was this. Every single part of the genome presented a different tree, every single part. So we had 14,000 different loci and they all had different trees. How are you going to make sense out of 14,000 different trees? Can you make sense? And is the evolution actually tree-like in that situation? Okay, the other project was a plant phylogeny. We published this in PNAS. And we had, um, in this first paper in PNAS, we only had about 100 species, uh, about 800 genes. And we saw lots of challenges in terms of gene tree conflict, which again is the second bullet there. Lots and lots and lots of gene tree conflict. Uh, but the next analysis that we're now engaged in, we're looking at 1,000 plant species with 1,000 genes. And these are multiple copy genes. So we end up having uh, multiple sequence alignment challenges that have more than 100,000 sequences in them. And anyone who knows about multiple sequence alignment will know that that's an enormously hard problem. And worse, the sequences are fragmentary. So how do you get multiple sequence alignments on really big data sets, and how do you do that well when you have fragments? Very, 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 very hard. But the main challenge here that I'm going to talk about today is not this multiple sequence alignment problem that we're also working on, but rather Again, the massive gene tree conflict. So in both of these projects, we have massive gene tree conflict. This is turning out to be a pretty common problem in nearly every phylogenomics project that anyone's doing. And so what does it mean, and how do you deal with it? So this talk is going to be about this challenge of how do you do species tree estimation when you have gene tree conflict. But in order to talk about that, I'm going to begin with talking about a very simple problem, which is gene tree estimation. So instead of multiple genes, just a single gene. How do you do gene tree estimation? And then after we understand that, we'll talk about gene tree conflict and what it's due to, and then how do you estimate species trees when you have gene tree conflict. There will be a little bit of mathematics in the talk. 
And for those of you who don't like math, you can ignore it. But I'll come quickly back to data. Mostly it's going to be data, some math. And then at the end, what I'm going to focus on are the impact of gene tree estimation error on doing species tree estimation and two methods that we've developed to deal with this really important challenge. OK. So I'm going to start with a cartoon of DNA sequence evolution. So you have a sequence at the root of the tree, and it's going to evolve down this tree with substitutions. So what you have to remember is that human, chimp, gorilla idea. So at the end of the tree, you're going to have species. And what you're looking at is a part of the genome within each of the species. So this is a part of the genome in the ancestral species. Okay? So over time, you have speciation events. So you have now two species that have evolved from the first. And the sequences inside those genomes have changed. And then you keep going, and the sequences continue to change. And then you keep going, and the sequences continue to change. But now you have sequences at the leaves of the tree. And you're trying to reconstruct the tree from what you observe. You only get to look at what's at the leaves. You don't know the tree. You just get to look at the sequences at the leaves. So that's a statistical estimation problem. The reason it's a statistical estimation problem is that we model evolution using stochastic modeling. So we have these, a whole lot of families of stochastic models where you're describing how the sequences evolve mathematically. There, the simplest one is the Jukes Cantor model. Roughly, what that means is that you have a sequence at the root of the tree, the sequence itself is random, and when it evolves, the positions evolve independently of the others and identically. And yes? Yeah, just a question. So, back, can you just go back one slide just to see if I understood? So, you're, you're saying you, you don't have any historical record that would help provide like a you know, a marker that you could connect to to make sure that that piece has to come out of your analysis or something like that, or you're, you're not taking that into you're account. You're not assuming that you have any um, fossil data, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, right. N you're but not you assuming could, you right. have fossil data. You're okay. just looking at what's at the leaves. And even if you have fossil data, using the fossil data is hard. But yeah, I mean, you can use it if you have it, but it's not usually that reliable. Mm -hmm. So in a mathematical modeling here, we're just assuming we only get to look at what's at the leaves. Okay. OK, the properties of the evolutionary process are important, though. So if you make a very simple set of assumptions that every position is evolving identically and independently of the others, and that then you model the change for a single position. And the simplest model says, if you change, you change with equal probability. OK, that's the simplest model. You can make it more complicated, and you get more complicated models that people actually do inference under. But for a given model, you have this IID assumption. And what you're trying to do is find the model that fits the data. right? So this is the parametric model. You're trying to find the tree topology and the parameters that fit the data best. OK, so maximum likelihood under that model would say, I know it's Jukes scanner. I just don't know the tree, and I don't know the substitution probabilities. So I'll try to find the tree and the best substitution probabilities for the data. But you can make it more complicated, and you still have the same kind of thing. Find the tree and find all the numerical parameters that best fits the data. Okay, Maximum likelihood. NP-hard, people want to analyze big data sets. Big data sets cannot be an analyzed correctly with high you know, accuracy uh, in any kind of reasonable amount of time. Um, and this is an example where even just 50 sequences, but very long ones, took more than 200 CPU years. So if you wanted to scale this up to you know, 1,000 or 10,000 or a million, you would not be able to do it using existing methods. And so this is a good challenge for NCSA to try to work on. How do you do really large scale maximum likelihood? OK, again, the challenge is taking sequences and getting the tree. What you'll notice here is this tree is not rooted. What generates the data is rooted, and what you estimate is not rooted. Mathematically, it's because it's a time-reversible model. You can't actually figure out the root. Just don't worry about that. Okay? So we're going to try to estimate the unrooted tree, and we'll consider ourselves correct if the tree is correct as an unrooted tree. So you can quantify error in a simulation. So this is an example where you generate data on a tree. This is the tree that you use to simulate evolution. You look at the sequences that you simulate, and then you estimate the tree. And then you annotate every edge of the tree that you compute based upon the true tree, which is what you use to generate the data. So for example, 
uh, the edge, um, this isn't, there it goes. This edge splits S1 and S2 from S3, 4, and 5, and that's the same edge as this one, so it's a true positive. This is an edge that splits S4 and S5 from the others. It's not in your estimated tree, so it's a missing branch, also call it a false negative. And this is a false positive, okay? So you look at the fraction of the tree that you get wrong, you look at the fraction of the tree that you miss, those are the error rates. And it's only with respect to the internal edges. So this is two internal edges, one's wrong, one's right, 50% error. We'd like to have error below 5%, preferably zero. Okay, so that's the idea here. Maximum likelihood is statistically consistent. As the amount of data increases, this is to say sequence length, as the amount of data increases, the error will go to zero. This is a theorem. This is what a simulation might look like. It doesn't have to go monotonically to zero, it just has to eventually get as close to zero as you want. So that's the concept of statistical consistency. It's a very desirable concept in statistical estimation. It means if you have enough data, you're gonna get the correct tree with high probability. Data here are the sites in the alignment or the sequence length. So that suggests to you that you can get genome scale phylogeny, right? If you have genome scale data, you can get the phylogeny, right? Everyone should say yes, that should work, right? Okay, good. Um, Okay, so what happens if we actually try to do this, like with human chimp gorilla? Human chimp gorilla doesn't work. Um, the reason it isn't gonna work is that different parts of the genome actually have different histories. So if you look at human chimp gorilla and you look at multiple genes, you're gonna find that it's not the case that every gene gives you the same tree that we're seeing here, where human and chimp are more closely related than they are to gorilla. It doesn't happen that way. So when you use multiple genes, you get one gene, you get another gene, you get another gene, and then you put them into one big matrix. Question marks are for missing data. And then you just run maximum likelihood, right? Of course, I'm drawing a rooted tree coming back. Just pretend it's an unrooted tree. So the problem is that different parts of the genome can have different histories. You can say why, and there are many answers. One of the dominant answers is something called incomplete lineage sorting. So incomplete lineage sorting is something that affected the avian phylogenomics project and affected the thousand plant transcriptome project. Incomplete lineage sorting is one of the most dominant reasons that gene trees are different from the species tree. It's basically a population level process which means that it's not like there's a single organism in your species that's evolving. You have a whole population of things that are evolving. And you're looking at how the gene trees are different from each other. And this is confounding analyses in many, many, many taxonomic groups. And if you do Google Scholar and you say how many papers talked about incomplete lineage sorting in 2013, it's more than 1,000. So there's a lot of it. And there's a big debate in the community, which is to say the biological community, about how to analyze data when you have gene tree conflict due to incomplete lineage sorting. The debate is really heated, and it's very interesting. And I see some people nodding, so I know that that, that debate is uh, understood, or at least you're aware of it. So it's part of what makes getting even small data sets accurately analyzed. So um, what is incomplete lineage sorting? As I said, it's a population level process. It's actually a forward process, but I'm gonna describe it in the backward process, which is easier to understand. So imagine you've got these four individuals. By the way, the human is James Degnan, who will, is a mathematician who will be visiting here in March. So if you're interested in hearing more about the mathematics of this area, I will let you know about when he's giving a talk. So you go backwards in time, each individual picks one allele for one gene, and it traces it back in time th through the parent that it got its allele from, and backwards and backwards and backwards. And the point is that you don't necessarily come to a common ancestor within the, the branch that you first branch that you could. So if you trace this back in time, you'll see that these two lineages, um, sorry, these two lineages here and here could have coalesced on this branch, but they do not. They come up here, they now have a chance to coalesce. The coalesce means finding a common ancestor. But in fact, the pair is not the pair that coalesces first. And instead, you have um, the gorilla and the orangutan coalescing before the other pairs. 
So you get a tree that's different from the true species tree, and that's an example where the gene tree is different. Okay? That's, that's the whole point where gene trees can be different from species trees. This is well understood. This is not new mathematics. This came from Kingman's coalescent um, in the 1982. This has been studied by Wayne Madison and other people over the last several decades. It's a well-established mathematical reality that you will get gene trees that are different from the species trees with high probability. If you have enough gene trees, some of them are going to differ. If you have the right conditions, which is short amount of time between speciation events, it's going to happen with increasing frequency. So it's a problem that will happen, okay? It will happen on some of your data, in some cases on most of your data. So the key observation mathematically is that under this mathematical model, you get a distribution on the gene tree topologies. That mathematical distribution actually defines the species tree. So if you have enough gene trees, you can get the species tree correctly. Back to statistical consistency. Enough gene trees, you can get the species tree exactly with high probability. Okay? This is the mathematics behind it. So what does this mean in terms of methods? Now I'm switching from just math back to computer science and statistical inference. You can ignore causes of gene tree discord and just say, I'm going to concatenate everything and get a tree. You can just do that. And in fact, there was a paper that was published in Science recently on insects that did exactly that. Didn't concern itself with gene tree discord, just concatenated everything and got a tree. It's, it's time-honored practice, okay? So that's one option, except that it's not statistically consistent. It can give you the wrong tree with high confidence. And that's a recent result by Sebastian Rock and Mike Steele theorem, that under the right amount of ILS, incomplete linear sorting, you can get the wrong tree, okay? Now that concatenation analysis is maximum likelihood when you put everything into one matrix and you do what's called an unpartitioned analysis. So if you read the paper, that's what it's doing. Okay, on the other hand, another alternative is that you construct trees on every gene and you combine the gene trees. And you're basing that analysis on this fact that the probability distribution defines the, G the species tree. So the probability distribution on gene trees gives you the species tree. So you can estimate the probability distribution given enough gene trees, okay? That's the whole idea. The third option is you, you take the sequence alignments and you co-estimate gene trees and species trees at the same time. Very valuable, very interesting, extremely computationally intensive. Does not run on more than about 20 species and more than about 50 genes. So we're gonna discard the third one, it's not scalable. And let's look at the other two. So concatenation, time honored. Any systematists in the group? No systematists? Not a single one? Any molecular evolutionary biologists? OK. And a bunch of you, you, you do this, right? You do concatenation? Yes? No? You won't admit to it? I hand wave? OK. OK. So we're going to really just do a comparison between these, these methods. OK. Two competing approaches basically for large data sets, concatenate, don't worry, analyze separately, and combine. I'm going to call the, the type of method that combines gene trees, I'm just going to call them summary methods. They've also been called shortcut methods, but I'm just going to call them summary methods. So summary methods take gene trees, combine them into a species tree. Okay? How do they compare? So how could you even do it? Is it even possible? I'm going to give you a very brief sketch of a mathematical proof. Here's how it's possible. Under the multi-species coalescent model, you might say, let me just look at all of the gene trees. Whichever one appears the most often, I'm going to use that. Now, the, the molecular evolutionary biologist in the audience will say, don't do that, don't do that, because it's now known that the most frequent gene tree can be wrong. And that's called the anomaly zone. So don't do that. OK, what about take some kind of a consensus of the gene trees? Well, don't do that either. That's also wrong. So what could you do? James Degnan proved that under the multi-species coalescent, if you only look at three species at a time, the most frequent gene tree will be the species tree with high probability. Only three species at a time. The rooted three species gene tree will be topologically identical to the species tree. So mathematically, that gives you an algorithm. You just look at three species at a time, 
look at the most frequent gene tree on those three species, write them down. And then you can just use them to get a species tree. Combine them algorithmically. It's a very simple idea. So you do that. You find all the, what we call, dominant gene trees for three species at a time. And so you get that collection. And then you just combine them using a technique from database theory. So Ahos, Segev, and uh, Ahos, Szymanski, um, Segev, and Allman show that you could actually, using it for a database problem, combine rooted triplet trees and get the true species tree. Well, they didn't care about species, but yes. OK, so polynomial time, statistically consistent, perfect accuracy given enough gene trees. Everyone's happy, right? We have solved incomplete lineage sorting, right? Um, you can do the same thing with four taxon trees. The same theory works out. So you can go from unrooted gene trees to an unrooted species tree, or from rooted gene trees to a rooted species tree. No problem. Statistical consistency here says that as the number of gene trees goes to infinity, your error will go to zero. Except note what's underlined. You need true gene trees. OK, now, molecular evolutionary biologists, how easy is it to get exactly true gene trees with no error? No, not so easy. So how do they perform in practice? I'm sort of letting you know what the problem is going to be, right? It's, the problem is that you, you can't handle any error. But a bunch of statistically consistent methods, and how do they perform? So MPS is maximum pseudo likelihood. It's uh, it is a statistically consistent method. The population tree from Bucky, statistically consistent. Everything else is not consistent, OK? And we're going to see how well these perform. I'm also going to show you something using star beast, which co-estimates gene trees and species trees. Simulation study. Um, this is a simulated data from, from Cecile Anne and her student from, from Wisconsin. Um, we took their data sets but analyzed their data using other methods. This is 11 species at a time, and we go from five genes only on the left down to 50 genes on the right. And so as you increase the number of genes, the error is going down for all the methods. But what I want you to notice, so the y-axis is error. We want low error, OK? The best method here is in yellow. Yellow is concatenation using maximum likelihood, not statistically consistent. The second best method is star beast in red, right? That's statistically consistent. On 10 genes, those are the two best methods. On 25 genes, they're still the two best methods, but now um, something else, bright blue, which is phylonet, also not statistically consistent, has equal accuracy. So what you're seeing is that on these data, the most accurate method is concatenation. Now, this is not supposed to happen. It's not statistically consistent, right? OK, we notice weak ILS, low amounts of gene tree discord. Increase the amount of ILS, harder condition. It's still the case. Concatenation is still really good. Concatenation and star beast are the two best methods. Concatenation is not statistically consistent, and star beast is. So the first thing to notice, concatenation isn't as bad as people say. Okay, That's number one. Number two, that you can get better results if you co-estimate than if you estimate them individually. So we went and looked at these analyses, and we realized if we took the gene trees that star beast is producing, and we combined them using something simple, even a greedy consensus, we got essentially the same accuracy as we were getting with star beast. So the issue was the gene trees. And if you look, star beast is giving you better gene trees. The reason it's good is it's getting better gene trees. So the problem is gene tree estimation error. Here what I'm comparing are gene trees computed in this co-estimation framework versus gene trees computed using maximum likelihood independently of each other. If you do it independently, you have higher error. If you do it in co-estimation framework, you get low error. So, what this is saying, if you have gene trees that you're estimating independently, you can get error. And here's an example of taking MPS on true gene trees versus MPS on estimated gene trees. In estimated gene trees, in blue, you have about 9% error in the species tree. On true gene trees, which is in uh, green, I think you can tell that there's nothing showing in green. That means there's no error. True gene trees, the species tree is accurate. Estimated gene trees, the species tree is not accurate. Estimation error in the gene trees is the problem. OK? That's the challenge. So how do we deal with the challenge of getting accurate gene trees? 
Uh, one hypothesis is you should just use the very best statistical methods that you can to get good gene trees. Unfortunately, we are using the best statistical methods and we're not getting better gene trees, right? So how do you do better? So again, the problem is that these summary methods are combining estimated gene trees, not true gene trees. The, uh, the simulated data have estimation error. When you have estimation error in your gene trees, you get bad species trees. The reason that they have estimation error is that you don't get perfect estimations on the data. You have insufficient signal often. You just don't have long enough sequences to get accurate gene trees. If you don't get accurate gene trees, you're not going to get accurate species trees. And when you combine them, you get poor species trees. Okay. Theoretically, you might say, are these summary methods guaranteed to recover the true species tree given an unbounded number of gene trees if the gene trees have estimation error? Do they have any theoretical guarantees at all? And does anyone know the answer? Okay, the answer is there are no guarantees. There's no theorems showing any robustness to gene tree estimation error. So the only robustness you have is with true gene trees and enough of them, you're okay. You have to have true gene trees for a theorem. Okay, so that's the typical case, poor gene trees. So how are you gonna deal with this? Lots of different options, but the thing that we're doing is we're developing methods that can deal with gene tree estimation error. I'm gonna show you results using two methods. I'm gonna describe the two methods and then I'll show you results using these two methods. The first method is called Astral, and it's a very, very simple method that actually is more robust to gene tree estimation error. It still combines gene trees, it's just more robust. The second technique, which is actually the one I'll show you first, is statistical binning. So what statistical binning is doing is saying, if you have poorly estimated gene trees, can we do something interesting and get better estimated gene trees? Okay, can we just improve the gene trees? And if we can improve the gene trees, then when we combine them, we can get better species trees. So I'm gonna tell you about these two techniques, but before I move on, are there any questions? Okay, so what I'm gonna be telling you about now are what we're doing to deal with real world challenges in a genome scale phylogenetic analysis when the gene trees are not estimated with perfect accuracy. Okay, so the first one I'm gonna tell you about is what we did for the avian phylogenomics project. So in this case, we had 14,000 different gene trees, but the, they were very poorly estimated. And the reason I say they were poorly estimated is that there was very little phylogenetic signal in any of these sequence alignments. Almost all of them had what we call bootstrap support below 50%. In fact, for the, for the biologists in the audience, the exons were the worst. So what we needed were introns, and we needed, if possible, very long introns. We couldn't deal with the, con con the conserved sequence evolution within exons. I mean, we could deal with them, but they had very, very poor bootstrap support. 27% was the average, okay? Very poor gene trees, okay? I I I'm seeing the this registering, which is good. So that's what you've got. Um, so here's what statistical binning does, and this was published in Science as one of the uh, papers in the special issue. In general, you've got this like 14,000 gene trees, and you're basically saying, if you have 14,000 different trees, how, many, how much of that difference is due to estimation error? And how much of it is real? So you're gonna use the bootstrap support to give you a clue as to whether or not it's just random resolution around very, very poorly resolved edges, in other words, estimation error, or is it real? And so you have a threshold that the user picks and says, if the differences have bootstrap support above this amount, then don't consider them to be combinable. They're actually real differences. And otherwise, you could combine them. Okay, so there's a statistical threshold that you pick, which is T. And now you're gonna partition your genes into sets so that in each set, every pair of them, the differences look like it's just estimation error. Now, now you have larger sets. And these larger sets can be concatenated because maximum likelihood is not so bad, right? If, if you have, uh, you know, it, even though you don't have a guarantee of statistical consistency, you could combine it. But when you combine them, you're assuming that they have the same tree. In that case, it's okay to combine them as long as you do a partitioned analysis. So you do a partitioned analysis, which means you're looking for a single tree, but you're allowing all the other parameters to be estimated gene by gene. That's the key. Okay. So 
Um, we actually, what we used in the science paper was something we call the unweighted statistical binning technique. We also have a variant called weighted statistical binning, where you get a new tree on each bin, but you copy the number of g times that you have genes in that bin, you make as many copies of the tree. So now you have extra copies of, the, of each uh, tree, as many now new trees as you started off with with genes. So two types of statistical binning. OK, here's how it performs on those same 11 taxon data sets. You remember I showed uh, the 11 taxon data sets with strong ILS and how much error there was with different methods? So this is a different collection of methods. The only thing here that's statistically consistent is this MPS on the left-hand side. And sorry, my, uh, this thing is not moving. So I'm just going to. On the left-hand side, it says MPS. So if you don't use binning, it has about 9% error. If you do binning, it goes down to about 4% error. Every method has high error if you don't bin, if you just run the method naively. But if you do the binning, it reduces, like by half. So binning is reducing the error in the species tree estimation. It's using these new gene trees and then combining them using some other method. OK, we did a mammalian simulation based upon a study from PNAS, and we saw the same kind of thing. If you bin analyses, if you do this statistical binning, you either don't change things or you make them better. And what's really interesting here is that you can see cases where concatenation, which is Raxamel in green, has lower error than the unbinned analysis, but has higher error than the binned analysis. So binning isn't just taking you closer to concatenation. It's actually allowing you to get the best of both worlds. So we explore this under lots of different variations, low amounts of ILS, high amounts of ILS. We see this kind of consistent story. Binning is allowing you to be at least as accurate as concatenation under conditions where an unbinned analysis can be less accurate. OK. In the avian simulation, we've looked at various things, increasing the amounts of ILS, change, uh, in looking at different types of genes, low signal, high signal. Uh, and, and what we're getting in every case is that binning is improving analysis relative to unbinned. So we're, again, the y-axis is error. And as you go from left to right in the, in the less, leftmost curve uh, up here, this is unbinned analysis. And we're increasing the gene tree quality, and the error is going down. But unbinned starts off at about 23% error. Binning starts off at about 14% error. Here's concatenation, OK? So unbinned analyses is just really not as good. This is a similar thing with changing the amount of ILS. On the avian data itself, if you did MPS, you got a tree that conflicted with lots of established literature about birds. And in particular, we got a tree that did not return a particular clade called Columbia, which is one of the major findings in that paper. But if you did the binned analysis, so the binned analysis is on the left, the unbinned analysis is on the right. The binned analysis is extremely close to the concatenation tree that we produced. The unbinned analysis is extremely different. So what this is saying is that coalescent analyses are often different from concatenation analyses, but it's because they have problems with gene tree estimation error. And if you do something like this and improve the gene trees, you get things that are a lot closer together. And it really addresses some of the controversy about should you use a concatenation analysis or should you use a coalescent analysis, OK? So, so that's the avian uh, study. We had to do this in order to be able to present a coalescent analysis. Without it, we would have had this tremendous conflict between the two trees. We wouldn't have known what was right. This allowed us to have some confidence in what we were returning. So that's the avian study. Now I want to tell you what happened with the plant study. When we were looking at the plant study, we had, um, in the PNAS paper, we had 100 or so plants. MPS cannot run on data sets that big. It basically stops giving reasonable results at about 50. In fact, it may not even be OK on 50. 
It also needs everything to be rooted. Not all the gene trees were rooted. So we couldn't use MPS. We needed a different method. So remember, statistical binning just gives you better gene trees. You still need a coalescent method. With the plant data, we needed a different method altogether. So we developed something called Astral. So Astral is a method that we published in a, um, Bioinformatics. And it's a statistically consistent method for estimating species trees from unrooted gene trees. And I'm going to describe it briefly, because um, it's published, you can see it, and I think I'm probably running out of time. But the basic idea is you have a collection of gene trees, and you try to find a species tree that is as close as possible to all of your gene trees under a quartet metric. Now, that's just how many quartets does it share how many quartet trees does it share with all of your gene trees? You might think that has nothing to do with the coalescent. But we already showed earlier that the most frequent quartet trees will be the same as the quartet species tree, if you look at them as unrooted trees. So there's actually a statistical consistency guarantee. It's not a problem, even though it doesn't have any parameters you're optimizing. So an exact solution to this is a statistically consistent method in the presence of ILS. The problem is computationally, it's an NP-hard problem, we suspect. It's very close to problems we know are NP-hard, so we think it's NP-hard. So you're not going to be able to solve this problem exactly. So rather than coming up with a, a complete heuristic, we constrain the search space, and inside that constrained search space, we solve it exactly in polynomial time. And by constraining the search space properly, we maintain statistical consistency. So we, what we do is that we constrain it so that the tree that we're looking for is going to take its bipartitions from an input set. And we start off making sure that that set of bipartitions includes everything in the gene trees. I'm skipping as to why this gives you statistical consistency. I can tell you if you're interested. But the idea is that we can do this. And we can do it in polynomial time. So how well does it perform? This is a simulation study based upon the mammalian simulation we did before. And we're comparing MPS to astral and concatenation. <laughs> One comment here, the model tree is defined by MPS. The model tree is what MPS computes on the data. So if it's going to favor any method, it's going to favor MPS. Okay? So the MPS model tree is shown, the error rates are shown in red. The astral results are shown in blue, light blue, and concatenation is dark blue. And under this 0.2x is the branch lengths. So Short branches give high gene tree discord, high ILS. And then you go down to long branches, which have low ILS. Error decreases as you make the branches longer. Therefore, error is you know, because the ILS is going down. The highest error here is from concatenation. It has the highest ILS. It's not surprising that it has high error in the presence of ILS. Then comes MPS, then comes astral. Under lower ILS, as you decrease it, concatenation gets better and better. And eventually, it's as good as astral, and then it's better than everything. So under low enough ILS, there's still ILS, but low enough levels, concatenation is the best thing to do. In between, astral is better than MPS. Okay? So MPS is a dominant method. Being better than MPS is, has been you know, what you're trying to be better than. This is actually doing better than all these methods. So this is only on 37 species. We need something that can go to the next data set that we want to analyze. We used it to analyze the plant data set, which has 100 species. We need it for the next analysis, which will have 1,000. We need to be able to do 1,000 species and 1,000 genes. So here we have a running time issue. We had to re-engineer the algorithm keeping it polynomial time, but shaving off a factor of, of n, where n is the number of species. So we brought it down to a much lower degree polynomial. Running time now, it can go to 1,000 species and 1,000 genes. This is unpublished work now. Um, what we're showing is the running time as a function of the number of taxa, which is the number of species, and the number of genes. And, and so um, Astral runs sequentially. This is not a parallel implementation runs sequentially, finishes in about uh, eight hours on 1,000 um, species and uh, 200 genes. But if you run it on 1,000 at 1,000 of each, 
then you're actually about 25 hours, okay? Sequential operation, not parallel. The other methods either don't run at all on big data sets, or they take much longer. So, so that's the observation. So, and nothing but Astral was running on 1,000 genes and 1,000 species. So now I've told you we have statistical binning, which deals with gene tree estimation being low accuracy, gives you better gene trees. Astral actually gives you better species trees. It still combines gene trees and has really fast running time and it can go to 1,000 of each. The people who did this, are the students that I have still at Texas. Uh, Siavash Mirarab in particular, he was first author, co-first author on the science paper, co-first author on the PNAS paper, the developer of Astral. He's really quite uh, wonderful and he's graduating. Um, this work has been supported by the Guggenheim, NSF, the fellowship, the, the professorship I had at Texas and the current professorship that I have here. Um, and most of the computational work was done at uh, Texas, but I'm looking forward to moving everything here and using the routines here. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot. So, questions? Hi, great talk. Um, so when you're looking at um, estimating species tree, you're mostly focusing on ILS, which can kind of give you a random association. Uh, could these methods be as useful in places where you have other types of error, like convergence? Um, so the things I work on, life history changes seem to be associated with substitution bias direction. Okay, so, so there's, I want to answer your question in a somewhat broader context. So, so you're asking, can these methods be useful under other conditions? Uh, so the, the thing you brought up had more to do with when the gene trees are estimated under simplistic models, but they should be estimated under more complex models, yes. right? Okay, that's a separate issue about how do you get, how do you deal with uh, model misspecification in your gene tree estimation error, right? So, and I'm really interested in working on that, and I have done some work on genome rearrangements, but that's still getting... Uh, and, and, your, and, and alignment error, right? And inversions contribute to alignment error. So the issue that you're talking about, if I understand you, is more about can you get better gene trees when you have this kind of model misspecification? That is a longer discussion. But what I would like to answer was what I th thought you were going to, which is other reasons for gene trees being different from the species tree. So other reasons for gene trees to be different from the species tree are like duplication and loss or incorrect orthology, or horizontal gene transfer, as well as other things. So astral, we're studying astral for horizontal gene transfer and showing that it's actually quite accurate even if you have horizontal gene transfer and incomplete lineage sorting. It may actually be accurate even when you have duplication and loss. Okay. Um, so th there's that. For your, for your, so the answer, I think, is yes to if you're talking about gene tree heterogeneity, if you're talking about model misspecification for gene tree estimation directly, that is a different question. Yeah, well, I was kind of thinking about it because you talked quite a bit about statistical binning and, and, and reducing this effect of, of error in the gene trees. And I was just wondering how that would behave when you have maybe a convergent scenario where maybe quartets go one direction or another strongly favored. I, I, I don't know if I'm still blurring the line there. But. So, okay, Astral's a quartet method. Statistical binning has nothing to do with quartets. Okay. So you could think of statistical binning as being something that might help you get better gene trees, independent of what you're going to do with those gene trees. Okay. Okay. I think I might be confused. Whereas Astral that. is how do you combine gene trees to get a better species tree. Okay. So those, those are those, they have different purposes and different applications. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I wondered if you could say something about the practical applications as we understand these, these trees with uh, uh, larger trees with more accuracy. How do they, do they does that benefit come to a society somehow? Okay, so I'm just gonna go back here. This is the avian um, tree. So the one on the left is extremely close to whatever we got on the concatenation analysis as well. The concatenation tree and this um, MPS star tree, in other words, the binning version of MPS, 
was the basis for nearly every scientific conclusion in the papers that came out. For example, things like um, uh, the evolution of vocal learning. Like, how is this happening? What are the genes that are involved? So when you have a phylogeny, it allows you to look at uh, the, the evolution of traits and how they're correlated with different aspects of genes, genes evolution, you know, evolution of different genes and function. So phylogenies give you this context for answering other biology. That's where not getting an accurate phylogeny causes incorrect scientific inferences. It's also been looking, looked at to get estimates of dates, right? So if you want to know when these things happen, first you get the phylogeny, then you get, especially since you're doing a species tree estimation, branch units and branch lengths and coalescent units. All of this gives you stuff that you can work with to get at when these things happen and see if they're connected to geological events and things like that. So, so that's that context. But there are other people here who could answer that much better because they actually do these kinds of things. Yeah. So uh, suppose you have your species tree and, and think about the inverse problem because you've talked about astral as, as giving you correct species tree even in the presence of horizontal gene transfer. So is, is the, does the inverse problem sort of fall out? Suppose what you want to find out is horizontal gene transfer. Can you... Uh, does it, can astral do the inverse problem or some variant of it do that? Okay, so I don't have an answer for, for your second question, uh, for your question. So the model in which we've studied astral right now is where you have really quite random horizontal gene transfer, uh, as a, where what you have is an underlying species tree, and then you really allow very free mixing between different lineages. It, it can depend upon how distant they are evolutionarily, Right? The probability of mixing can depend upon that, but it can happen between any pair of uh, lineages that coexist in time. In that situation, there's nothing to be inferred other than the underlying tree. I mean, you could look at a gene-by-gene -gene basis and say, did it transfer or not? And that's easy enough once you get the species tree hypothesis and the gene. But if you're trying to reconstruct what I would call an actual network, an actual network would be something where you have uh, like what we call also... Um, um, HGT highways. So there's particular part of the phylogeny where there is a lot of transfer happening. That's a different question. It's even a different model for the kind of distribution of gene tree topologies you're going to get. We haven't studied it in that context yet, and that's a harder type of problem. So one particular place where lots of stuff is being transferred, that can actually distort the signal much more than this kind of random stuff. The random stuff is a lot easier to deal with, and we're, we're pretty robust for that. When there's a directed signal, that's harder. Okay? So I don't have an answer to that really interesting question, but it's a very interesting question. Um, you've given us a very nice overview of the methodological problems that are associated with doing correct tree and species, uh, gene tree and species tree estimations. Where do you think the main computational challenges lie? Well, I, I, I'm quite, uh, I'm going to go back to this, like, something very early on. Okay, so today I talked about how do you get species trees from incongruent gene trees. That's the only thing I really talked about. I think it's actually a very rich area with a lot of low-hanging fruit, okay? A lot. But... The thing that you're dealing with there is the impact of error in your input on your estimation methods. So in general, I think the biggest lesson from all of this is that we have many different theorems about things having good accuracy when they don't have any estimation error to deal with in their input. Just d directing the statistical research to address this, that's a really fundamental thing. What is the impact of error in your input on your estimation. 
You know, so the, there's a trade-off between data quantity and quality. Sometimes when you go to large data, your data are much noisier than when you have small data. And we have to understand that different methods respond differently. So there's just this theoretical statistical work that needs to be done there. In terms of other computational things, the most important, so at the very bottom it says data mining to uh, explore multiple optima. How do you, if you're doing, for example, large scale multiple sequence alignment, you're trying to do phylogenies and alignments on very big data sets, each individual alignment can take 100 gigs. If you want to store thousands of these so you can explore them, you have big challenges just in terms of the data size, right? Um, other, the top stuff is just how do you do large scale statistical estimation? Many people want to do Bayesian techniques. They want to use Bayesian methods because you get a certain kind of information back. Those things don't scale. So getting, they don't scale to large numbers of species. They really don't. You know, you might be able to do a few hundred, but you're not going to be able to do 10,000. And maximum likelihood than 10,000 is feasible, you know, using current heuristics. So I would say getting Bayesian methods to be able to scale to large numbers of species, a major challenge. Getting maximum likelihood to scale the data sets with many sequences and long sequences, nothing does that. Nothing does that well at all. So there's lots of basic, basic, basic challenges here that are perfect for a combination of high performance computing, algorithm design, data mining, um, all sorts of stuff. And then I have visualization of large trees and alignments. That's way open also. I mean, there's lots of visualization challenges. People would like to be able to do hand manipulations of alignments, but they need to look at them. And they need to look at them in a context that gives you that phylo the phylogeny. So the visualization tools that allow you to do modifications to your data, hand editing to your data, or even just look at them even if you don't want to edit them, way open. Lots and lots and lots of basic research here. Uh, that's very natural for statistics, computer science, and data scientists, and biologists. Take one more question. I think Matt, you were wanting, but I had just one comment on that. On that, just so you said hundreds of gigs and then thousands. Of, you'd need thousands, but in just Blue Waters has thousands exactly. of times 100 gigs. Exactly, so, which is in why, memory. So there's which, a which yeah. is why I think that this is a very good area <laughs> for Blue Waters. Yeah. I mean, this is why this is great. Good. So I, I'm also interested, like Eric, in uh, getting inference from individual gene trees compared to the species tree. Um, not just for HGT, but also for selection analysis. And it occurred to me that the reason why these coalescent trees perform poorly without the binning is, is largely because each uh, species tree carries a different amount of, sorry, each gene tree carries a different amount of phylogenetic signal and probably should be given a different weight according to its, the amount of data it contains, the amount of diversity it contains. Um, Binning is a is a one way around that, but if you want to actually interpret those genes, but that's treatments. what Astral is doing. In, implicitly, that's what Astral is doing. Okay, so so it, we can we can get at that. But as, that I, you're, I mean, the, your basic comment that don't treat each gene tree as equally informative is exactly right. The problem is even methods like MPS, which attempt to do that by looking at bootstrap replicates, do not have good accuracy. So there's no, there's, they don't have good accuracy when you have gene tree estimation error. Using the obvious techniques to try to make this work doesn't address it sufficiently. So you still, and, and still you have no theorems. You have absolutely no theoretical performance guarantees. So while I 100% agree with you, the point is that the obvious things to try don't give you the improvement you want. No, I was wondering if we could use your methods to get uh, some kind of significance data on the individual gene trees. That, but anyway. Ah. Let, let's continue this outside. Yeah. I just want to, because okay. we're, we're okay. running Good. a little late. So thanks a lot, Tammy. Okay. Thank great you. Having you.